violence is preventable. We need to start today. Um, we have a pedestrian struck by two cars coming in. So this is a trauma code. The first one that we saw earlier today was a trauma alert. So that is a potential for life or limb injury. So it's most likely going to have some kind of surgical need. So we have more of a surgery presence. So you see more people. Uh, I'm the uh, 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 Associate Vice Chair of Surgery at Christiana Care Health Systems and the former Medical Director of the Trauma Program, uh, serving about 16 years uh, in, the pro in that capacity. I currently oversee emergency surgical services at Christiana Hospital and uh, am intimately involved in the trauma program, still clinically practice and, uh, and on trauma call. and see these uh, see these injuries uh, quite often it's it's um, it's problematic uh, because when, especially when you look at gunshot wound victims okay, 26 year old male single gunshot wound right below the right scapula has been complaining of pain in the back as well as difficulty breathing we're treating the injury, uh, but we're not treating the problem. The, pro the problem is uh, violent acts. Uh, it's, it's the act that, that got the person there. And in, in this case, often that act is repeated. So you can make an argument that we're just sending somebody out to get shot again or shoot again, uh, and uh, that we're really not taking care of the problem. Uh, and that's for a physician, uh, any healthcare worker, that's, that's pretty, uh, pretty tough uh, because you're not, you know, you, you spend all this time trying to fix something and you really haven't fixed it. A disease, um, it's something that affects the organism in a negative fashion. If you look at uh, violence as, as a disease entity, well, it's it, violence as, as the vector in which the disease is brought to the human body, well, it is, right? Somebody shot somebody. They didn't use language to, for conflict resolution. They used a gun because of, they were disrespected or they were trying to rob somebody. You can look at it um, as also a disease of the community and disease of society. You can liken it to alcohol. We know alcohol and alcohol use is associated with motor vehicle crashes that, that harm and kill people. Now, how do you address that? You don't address the injury. You don't address the car. You address the alcohol use. This calendar year, the first three months, we've already seen 50 patients involved in gun shootings. If that trend continues, that will put us at about 200 trauma patients this year that have been involved in gun shootings. And that's gonna be almost 75 to 100 patients more than what we saw last year, which is a significant increase, um, especially for the state of Delaware. Um, and when you look at that number, um, it's astounding to us because we know it's absolutely preventable. Uh, trauma is the number one killer for people from the ages of one to 44. So it is a young person's disease. And it is our obligation as a level one trauma center and myself as a trauma program manager to do something to try and prevent it. Uh, the types of trauma that we see at the hospital uh, include predominantly motor vehicle accidents, um, blunt trauma from falls. Um, we also see a, a reasonable number of penetrating trauma. The uh, specific type of uh, um, penetrating trauma we get is usually centered on uh, uh, violent crimes uh, of some sort. Um, we see both the um, perpetrator of the crime as well as the victim of the crime. Uh, we oftentimes don't know which the person is and to be honest, it, it, it doesn't matter um, when we're managing what their medical problems are. Uh, we're truly treating the patient uh, independent of who and what they are outside of the hospital. 
I'm the uh, medical director of the trauma program uh, here uh, at the hospital. Um, we're a, uh, a large, busy, level one trauma center. Uh, we take care of uh, basically all the significant trauma patients in our, in our state. Uh, we're basically the, the only level one trauma center between Philadelphia and Baltimore. It takes a lot of resources uh, that are usually not adequately reimbursed to, uh, to care for uh, trauma patients. And there are uh, uh, 10 to a dozen caregivers that will, that will kind of ascend on this patient, or descend on that patient any way you look at it, uh, when they come in. Uh, yeah, I think the average you know, citizen who, who gets uh, injured uh, would be difficult for them to comprehend everything that goes into that. And that starts with them being picked up in the field by our excellent pre-hospital providers. You know, in my experience, uh, many patients that have gunshot wounds, what they are when they come out of here is what they were when they came in, unfortunately. Some of them have the aha moment, you know. Some of them really realize that, you know, life is better served being alive and being in one piece. Um, others kind of talk the talk and then they go home and walk the walk. The problem's not the injury, the problem's the, the act that caused the injury. Uh, and I'm not going to say it's the guns, it's not the guns, it's societal and economic issues. Now we can't fix that, but we can address it, we can identify it. Remember, recovery and convalescence is a teachable moment. It's, it's, it, it's when a person has to reflect on, on what's just happened. We need to use that to change, to, to, to create change in that person's behavior and the family's behavior. Often the family doesn't know anything about what had happened. So bring them in, and we have these resources in healthcare, social workers, pastoral care, psychiatry, but we don't integrate them, so we don't make a difference. And this is a problem we can address. We see the patients, uh, you know, and that's, that's, that's the aggravation, is to send them back out and have them come back in within the year, uh, this time maybe, maybe dead. Well, Probably about when I was freshman in high school, like I, I did the normal things that normal kids do, play sports, stayed outside, rode bikes, but I seen everybody else with the, all my older cousins with the cars and, and the money. I just wanted to know where they got it from and I was anxious really. Nobody really influenced me, I just did it myself. By the time I was 17, a little later than most of my friends, I was all the way out there in the streets. Cause a lot of my friends started at the age of 12, 13, 14. You know, in all our all the trauma centers, there's about 400, and in the urban centers, about 250. Um, have stories like this of the patients. Uh, you know, we've had patients that have had, you know. 10, 12 gunshot wounds, uh, you know, and then we patch them up, send them out, and they come in with 15. And uh, we just had one young man uh, over the last two years do that. And uh, then we'll send them out again, and what, you know, we expect next time they'll come in with 30, but, you know, at what time, what, at what point does it become absurd? I, I really didn't have to go this route, but I went this route because the people are hung around and the stuff they was doing, so I wanted to be down with them. But what I mean by like the money in the cars, like I didn't think all oh, this would come with it. I, I just was just thinking like, okay, maybe I sell a little bit of drugs and just be on my way. But like I never knew it was really like a territorial thing. I never knew that you really had to do certain things for, for, for people to give you certain things, like far as shoot at people or rob people or fight people or whatever the case may be. Injury prevention is really an, an intervention 
beyond surgery. It's an intervention of the psychosocial and socioeconomic aspects that cause the problem. And this is, when, you use the, when you look at this as a disease, and, uh, and violence is the cause of this disease, and uh, we have tools to address that violence. Now, how do you address the violence? You address it in the community, obviously, but you can address it at the individual level, the level of the family, the level of the community, the level of the society around it. That's what we're talking about. We are an intimate, healthcare is an intimate uh, component of that society. I spent over 20 years working in the trauma ICU at Christiana, and during that time, I saw the devastating consequences of trauma. Trauma from car crashes, trauma from uh, violence, whether it was gunshots, people being beaten up. The consequences to both the patient as well as to the families. Picked a lot of moms up off the floor while they were crying at the bedside. Had to tell a lot of moms, you know, we don't know if your kid's going to make it through the night. If they do, we don't know if they're going to wake up. And if they do wake up, we don't know what they're going to be like. Are they going to be in a nursing home for the rest of their life, staring at the ceiling? In the past few years, we've seen violence skyrocket in the city of Wilmington. So now we're addressing the violence, that the violent injuries that we're seeing coming into the hospital. We go into the community, uh, we talk to high schools, we talk to uh, middle school uh, kids, and we discuss all of the consequences of violent related injuries. Violence is 100% preventable. People make a decision to carry a gun. People make a decision to pull that gun out and shoot somebody. People make a decision not to walk away from a situation. Violence is preventable, and we're trying to get the message out to the community that these um, head injuries and these spinal cord injuries change your life in the most devastating ways. What we do in, in um, managing patients with gunshot wounds when you take them to the operating room is you follow the bullet. And really you just kind of follow where it goes in, where it goes out, or where you think it goes in and goes out, and you, you fix everything in between. And you hope that that fixes the patient. And sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. If you carry that out into the community, it really matters more because um, I can only fix so much. To fix the problem, you have to do that outside of the hospital. You have to prevent it from occurring. So if you follow the bullet into the community, you see the ripple effects that occur. You see the damage that it does to the family members. You see the damage that it does to the wives and the husbands and the children. You see the damage that happens to uh, the innocent bystanders who, 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 who we're just kind of minding their own business and leading a normal life. Um, you see what it does to a community. You see the expectation that this is going to happen again and uh, despair that comes with that. There's no surprise. Um, you know, you would expect that you walk into a room of a, of a family member, someone who's had a gunshot wound, and they would be surprised. There would be some type of, you know, um, disbelief, but there isn't because it happens every day. Everyone, you know, has someone that they know, a cousin, a friend, a family member that's um, been affected by or been shot. I definitely think that violence is preventable. I see it all the time here uh, working in the unit that I, that I work in. And Definitely makes me sad to see so many young black men who just are kind of lost. This is the culture that they grew up in. They hear on all the songs about the drugs, about the guns, and it's kind of cool to them. But I think it'd be prevented if at a young age, you have to intercept at a young age. This point of view and this frame of thought is happening when they're five and they're four and they're three and they're learning how to talk. and. Every time I talk to some of the patients who come in and if I feel like I can get through to them, I definitely try to impress upon them that you're worth so much more, your life is worth so much more than just being a statistic in a newspaper. And it's something that I try to impress upon them to you know, think about what you're leaving behind. Think about the imprint that you're putting on in society. Do you want to be looked at as that? Well, the things I experienced when 
what really got me a little cold hearted was when I was out of town with my uncle. And I seen somebody get shot in the head, point blank range. Then that just gave me like, it just opened up the an, another gateway. And then like, I just started seeing people just getting smacked with guns and people just getting shot at and just doing all types of crazy stuff. But like the main thing I think was when I was out of town, I seen that guy get shot in his head and it was the wrong person. So after that, it was just like, I don't want to be that person on the other end of that gun. So I'm going to be the person with the gun. So I just got a little bit cold hearted, just start running wild. It's, it really doesn't just happen on TV, it happens in real life. I don't think there's any question that uh, these patients are unfortunately seem to be getting younger, why most of our other patients are getting older. Um, I had a kid the other day, he was uh, 24 years old, and one of my remarks is, oh, he's kind of older for patients we've been seeing, you know, more, re more recently. I started at first, it started out slow, because so I was still in the school, but then as I got older and I, start, I just stopped listening to my mom, so I just started running wild, doing what I wanted to do. I had a friend that the first time he ever got shot, he died. Three months later, another friend got shot in front of his house and he died. But I'm blessed because both of them died before they was 21, within three months. Due to the increase in street violence, we've had to learn and educate ourselves on um, collecting evidence on victims of violent crimes. That would be your gunshot wounds, your stabbings, your people hit with baseball bats or blunt force trauma. When a trauma alert or trauma code is called, the trauma team, their job is to save the person's life and that is their main priority and the forensic nurse works around them. We never interfere with medical treatment while we're collecting evidence. It's kind of a delicate balance. They will always have priority, but we try to collect the evidence while they're doing what they do because the evidence that's there will not be there after they go to surgery or after they're in ICU for three weeks and they, um, you know, things like that. It just won't be there. The evidence is only there when they initially get here, which includes clothing, but documentation of the injuries. Injuries change with the resuscitation efforts. The day I got shot, I woke up. I wasn't expecting to get shot. Nobody expects to get shot. I just heard a, a big boom in my legs and just got real stiff and I fell. And I was shot in my lower right back. And when I hit the ground, I got shot again. I got shot in my right buttocks. And I was just crawling with, with my arms. Just crawling with my arms, just because I was in the, in the middle of